Nigeria crosses the 40,000 COVID-19 mark as NCDC records 555 new cases. Sultan of Sokoto advises Muslims to observe COVID-19 measures in Idil celebrations. In international news, tit for tat, U.S.-China diplomatic row continues as COVID-19 cases surge in the United States. And the sport, Jamie Vardy wins Premier League Golden Boots despite defeat to Manchester United. This is ANN News. I am Ola Jumukia Olasuji. We start with this announcement from the federal government that secondary schools in the country will reopen next Tuesday for exit classes only. Authorities say the Federal Ministry of Education, Commissioners of Education across the country, the Nigerian Union of Teachers, uh, chief executives of examination bodies had agreed that students in exit classes should resume immediately so they can prepare for the West African Examinations Council or AIC exams that begin in the middle of August. Moving on, Nigeria has now surpassed 40,000 cases of coronavirus. The Center for Disease Control confirmed on Sunday 555 new cases summing up the total to 40,532. Lagos recorded 156 cases, while Kano had 65. 57 infections were announced in Open State, while Plateau had 54. The rest of the cases were shared by 14 states and the federal capital territory. The first patient was diagnosed in the country exactly five months ago. Today, on February 27, within that short span, the country has recorded more than 40,000 cases. The Sultan of Sokoto, Al Haji Mohammed Said Abubakar, has asked Muslims nationwide to observe the government's COVID 19 measures in the upcoming Idi Kabir festival this week. The Emir, who is also the President General of the Nigeria Supreme Council for Islamic Affairs, gave the advice in a statement issued on Sunday through the Council's Deputy Secretary General, Professor Salis Shehu. The Sultan said Muslims in states where restrictions have been lifted on congregations' prayers, Muslims should observe idle prayers while still taking necessary safety measures of personal hygiene, wearing facial masks and observing social distancing. He said it is advisable to even avoid massive gatherings at one idle ground in a big city. He suggests performing those prayers in area masks to avoid what he called unmanageable crowds. Minister of Major Delta Affairs Gotson Akwabio has submitted to a National Assembly Committee a list containing names of lawmakers he said have benefited from NDDC contracts. The National Youth Council presented the documents to the media in Abuja on Sunday after the Speaker of the House refused to read the section of Akwabio's letter where the names were listed. Akwabio's letter was a response to an instruction by House Speaker Femi Badabia Mila that gave Akwabio 48 hours to submit names of lawmakers that had benefited from NDDC contracts. Akwabio had denied. He said most NDDC contracts were to lawmakers or went to lawmakers since 2001. Where he said the two community chairmen in both chambers were familiar with details of the contracts. He said the two chairmen certain influence on the com commission to appropriate embellished funds in the budget after passage of line items at plenaries. The House of Assembly's next line of action is yet unclear. The Central Bank of Nigeria is taking steps to address the country's infrastructure deficit. It has unveiled a plan to establish a $38 billion infrastructure development program. And correspondent Kilechi Mekalam explains what that entails. For the approval to establish a CBN-led infrastructure development company, which would leverage local and international firms for a building of critical infrastructure across the country. The sum of 15 trillion naira is projected over five years for the initial run. Nigeria's central bank governor, Godwin Emefiele, 
announcing the Apex Bank's development financing plan on the sidelines of the Monetary Policy Committee meeting. The $38 billion fund will be spread over a five-year period. It's part of President Mohamed Buhari's administration's policy thrust towards infrastructure development and economic advancement. And it's coming at a time the country has been hit by an economic downturn largely attributed to the decline in oil prices and shocks from the COVID-19 pandemic. This entity, which will be only focused on Nigeria and Nigerians alone, will be co-owned by the CBA, the African Finance Corporation and the Nigerian Sovereign Wealth Investment Authority, but exclusively managed by an independent infrastructure fund manager that will mobilize local and foreign capital Development economist Sam Amadi is confident that it will accelerate economic recovery. Of course, job creation, uh, infrastructure means a lot of jobs will evolve and these jobs will help to uh, you know, reduce the unemployment rates, which is close to about 33-35% now in terms of predictions that could happen post-COVID. So with this infrastructure, infrastructure work, especially if they are low-tech and focusing on low skill and a lot of low skill level, they will see both the poverty rate go down and then unemployment. Nigeria's huge infrastructure deficit has remained a topical issue as it has undermined the country's economic potential. Among other challenges, the West African nation faces poor transport networks, epileptic power supply and huge housing deficit. The government says it would require an estimated $93.3 billion annually over the next 30 years to bridge the infrastructure gap. For now, the $38 billion investment may be just a fraction of what's required, but it's seen as a step in the right direction. The Nigerian Association of Resident Doctors has given the federal government a three-week ultimatum to meet their demands so they will resume their strike. Nod National President Dr. Shokomba Aliyu said the decision to issue the ultimatum was reached at the association's recent virtual National Executive Council meeting in Gunbe. Some of the association's groups are the non-enrollment of healthcare workers in the group life insurance scheme for medical workers and the non-payment of death benefits to next of kin of their deceased members. The association is also demanding payment of COVID-19 hazard allowance and arrest to its members. It also wants an immediate implementation and funding of the Medical Residency Training Act to which both parties had agreed. Nard says the three-week notice is to give the federal government time to address its demands. It has set August the 17th as a resumption date of its suspended strike. Coming up, African stories, Ethiopia's grand renaissance, a sole sport for Egypt. And later, international news. Tit for Tat's US-China diplomatic row continues as COVID-19 cases surge in the United States. Watching A N N. Uh -huh. Tell them. They told me you are the best around here. What can I do for you, sir? I want my own. Very, very simple. I don't want any shy shy. If I see any shy shy shy. Actually, I'd love some sequins on my skirt. And I don't like any frills. I beg, I want frills on mine. But it must not be too tight. Tight. Not tight. Now, that is what I want. And the transition. Oh, you know what? I want a gown. Me too. I want to come to bang. You know what? You have to this. You know what? You know what? Did you capture all the information? Of course not. Actually, wow. fantastic. I give my customers what they love because everyone has their unique style. So why should they wear the same thing? Just like MTN for me, which gives unique data and recharge offers just the way you like it. Just dial star 121 hash and turn up great offers every day. Everywhere you go, MTN. Welcome back, this is CNN News. Tunisia is taking steps to cushion the effect of COVID-19 on its economy. 
Finance Minister Mizar Yeche has announced new measures to ensure the nation's economic stability in the face of COVID-19 pandemic. And correspondent Adne Jawochi has the details. Tunisia's Finance Minister said that the new measures are necessary in order to mitigate the negative impact of the coronavirus crisis on the country's fragile economy. These important measures include eight essential additional chapters relating to boosting investment, improving the business climate, supporting startups and innovative projects, in addition to strengthening the social aspect by supporting low income groups. Yaish added that the state will provide the financial, human, and logistical needs to implement the set of measures within a period of six to nine months. These measures also aim to fight poverty, modernize tax administration, digitize procedures, streamline financial transactions in cash, and integrate parallel activities into the economic circuit, in addition to fighting tax evasion, modernizing customs, and strengthening control. The Parliamentary Finance Commission approved the government's structural reform plan. Experts assert that Tunisia must reduce state expenses and the public sector wage bill in the next 18 months. In particular, there will be no recruitment in the civil service in 2020 and 2021. The economic situation is very difficult. It's unprecedented. The government is looking for additional resources to finance the state budget until the end of the current year. In the meantime, it's unacceptable to pay the salaries of over 800,000 civil servants while the economy is at its lowest level. The Ministry of Finance has created the Tunisian Fund of Funds to finance startups. Authorities will also boost public-private partnership and regional development projects. Tunisian Prime Minister Dessel Farfer announced that the new economic and social measures aim to increase growth and create wealth and investment by encouraging entrepreneurs in the private sector and improving the business climate. The state will also support strategic sectors, especially tourism and agriculture. Ethiopia has begun filling its Grand Renaissance hydroelectric dam a day after talks with Sudan and Egypt stalled. Egypt says it is worried the $4 billion dam could lead to water shortages for its citizens. Al Zagazi governorship has some of the most fertile lands in Egypt. Here in Mitabu Ali village, farmers consider themselves luckier than most others in the country. They're very close to the Nile. Yet access to its waters is a challenge. We don't have drinking water at home. We struggle every day to get it. We buy it. A gallon could cost up to two dollars. That's a lot of money. And we could wait a week for the drinking water to come. Without water, we can't eat or drink. Most people in rural Egypt work in agriculture. So to them, water is how they make a living. It's why many here are concerned about the Grand Ethiopia Renaissance Dam. Irrigation water is not always available, more so in the dry season in winter. There are channels that distribute the water to different areas in town. We've been learning techniques with different crops to consume less water because of the dam. With any further cut in water, we will starve. All Egyptians will. Water is no joke. When there is no Nile water, we have to use ground pumps, but the water quality is poor and it could take up to 10 hours to water the land, which costs more in gasoline and pumps rent. It takes just two hours to irrigate from the Nile branches. Everything in this part of the country revolves around water. While most international affairs would be of little interest to residents here, Almost all are following the news about the Nile Dam talks. We are very concerned about the Renaissance Dam. We did not reach any solution, but I see Ethiopia proceeding with the building and filling of the dam. There is no doubt it will have an effect on both irrigation and drinking water. Water here is already not enough. Without water, there is no life. The leaders of the three countries must find a solution through the AU, the Security Council, I don't care how, we need one. 
Almost all of Egypt's fresh water comes from the Nile. But its share of 55.5 billion cubic meters still does not cover domestic need. With desalination, recycling and groundwater, the nation reaches 70 billion cubic meters every year. It still needs some additional 20 billion to cover its annual demand for water. When we return, international news. Tit for tat, US-China diplomatic row continues as COVID-19 cases surge in the United States. And later, sport. Jamie Vardy wins Premier League Golden Boots despite defeat to Manchester United. You are watching ANN. Somewhere in the world, every second of the day, news is happening. And of course, Nigeria is bustling with news day and night. That is why ANN doesn't sleep. Our eyes are peeled, wide open, so no story escapes our radar. We stay abreast of world events and happenings at home. We keep you up to the minute in the world of sports. We give you information to stay on top of your investments and all the hard facts you need to navigate your day. If you miss us on air, you can keep up to date on our website and on our social media platforms, Twitter, Instagram and Facebook at ANN Africa TV. We are ANN Africa News Network. We do news right in a truly African spirit. Whether in your house, at your office, on your phone or online, we are there. We have the facts behind the headlines. We cut to the chase with the news you really need. We cover every angle. We are the bigger, better news network. We are African News Network, ANN. Watch ANN News on MITV from a truly African spirit. Welcome back. This is ANN News. U.S. health experts are pushing for another lockdown because of the continued surge in COVID-19 deaths in the country. Every day for the last four days, more than 1,000 Americans are reported to have died from coronavirus. Data from Jones. Hopkins University have put the U.S. COVID-19 total deaths at more than 146,000 as of Sunday. Researchers are projecting up to 175,000 COVID-19-related deaths by next month. Some 150 prominent medical experts, scientists, teachers, nurses and other experts have signed a letter urging leaders to shut the country down and start over to contain the rampant spread of the virus. Four states, including California, Georgia, Oregon, and Hawaii, have all recorded drastic numbers since Friday. California is leading the country with the most recorded coronavirus cases. The state now has close to half a million deaths. The police crackdown on protests in Portland, Oregon, continued overnight. Tear gas and stone grenades were fired from police that now encompass both the local authorities and federal law enforcement agencies deployed there by the Trump administration against the mayor's wishes. Reporter Mark Neal has the details. Outside the federal courthouse, protesters gather in the early evening as the event kicks off with a party-like atmosphere. A number of people tell me that protest numbers were down to about 50 people before federal law officers came to this site. Now, look at the crowd here. There are literally thousands of people attending. I asked these nurses whether they felt it was safe to protest during a pandemic. There are more people here being respectful and appropriately and like adequately masked up than just about anywhere else I've been around here. I didn't come here looking for a fight. I didn't come here looking for tear gas. I came here to support people. Elementary school teachers have also joined the cause, hoping to bring the focus back to racial injustice and also send federal law enforcement packing. I'm thinking about my students as a teacher. I'm also thinking about my daughter. And then I'm also just thinking about the city of Portland. 
and the feds are here. We don't want them here. I was out here a couple weeks ago and the protests are peaceful until the police and the feds show up. I definitely started getting emotional and uh, starting kind of feeling fearful, but um, I think this is really important. One of the main causes for fear, tear gas canisters, which federal officers began throwing shortly before the midnight hour to clear the crowd. You can see right down here, uh, the tear gas is coming out uh, a lot stronger and more intense, uh, but uh, protesters continue to advance, not worried about it. It's sort of a game of chicken in a way. Will they move back? Advance again, move back. This goes on for quite some time. Many of the protesters are well equipped with masks and respirators. Some even use leaf blowers to disperse the gas. Some make risky moves, daring to pick up canisters and throw them back. 114 federal law officers have been sent in to guard the courthouse. They face a barrage of commercial grade fireworks launched at them by unruly elements of the crowd. U.S. officials say numerous federal officers have suffered injuries and that at least three have likely been blinded by laser pointers. This is um, something that is now made far worse and now made far more chaotic. And downtown looks a lot different, dramatically different than it did just a few days ago since the arrival of uh, U.S. Marshals and Border Patrol. A chaotic situation with no signs of slowing down but instead all the ingredients for a dangerous showdown night after night. Chinese authorities say they have taken over the building that housed the U.S. consulate in Chengdu hours after the U.S. flag was lowered. The U.S. consulate in Chengdu officially closed Monday morning in the aftermath of the worsening relationship between Beijing and Washington. China ordered the U.S. Embassy to close on Friday in a retaliatory move after Washington instructed China's consulate in Houston, Texas to cease operations. The Chinese government gave the Americans 72 hours to close their Chengdu mission. Same time frame China was given last week to close its Houston consulate. Over the weekend, hundreds of people had gathered outside the U.S. consulate in the city of 16 and a half million taking selfies and waving Chinese flags. The consulate closures are a sharp escalation of the disputes between the two countries already damaged by disagreements over China's territorial claims in the South China Sea. It's new security law in Hong Kong, the situation in Tianyong and trade and technology. Pilgrims from across Saudi Arabia have started arriving in Mecca for the annual Hajj. People are seen wearing face masks and observing social distancing rules as body temperature is checked amid the coronavirus pandemic. Hajj is a religious duty all Muslims are required to perform at least once in their lifetime. More than 2 million pilgrims from around the world visit Mecca and surrounding areas every year. But this year, the Saudi government has decided not to accept pilgrims from abroad in an effort to curb the spread of the coronavirus. Only a limited number of domestic faithful will be allowed to attend the pilgrimage. Up next, sport. Jamie Vardy wins Premier League Golden Boots despite defeat to Manchester United. Please stay with us. You are watching ANN. We are on the road every day, canvassing throughout Africa for news you really need. We follow this story everywhere, from every corner of Nigeria to the wide African expanse. We bring you what's making headlines, we connect you with news you can use. ANN, African News Network, in a truly African spirit. Welcome back. This is Yana News in Sport. La Liga wants the second division game between Deportivo La Corona and Fluembrada Cancelled. The game was initially postponed after an outbreak of COVID-19 cases at Fluembrada, where 28 positive cases have been confirmed among players and staff. Fluembrada says they will not accept the decision until all competent bodies have signed off on it. 
33-year-old Leicester City still Leicester's title winning season. That is in the news this evening. Thank you for joining us. For details on these and other breaking stories, visit our website, nnafrica.news. Conversation continues on our social media platforms, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at ANN Africa TV. I am Olajumu Kyo Have a pleasant evening.